let's dive into the acquisition process and any relevant details that you were looking for as it relates to what you bought. Looking at the stuff that you get up to, it's exactly how I want to live my life in future. What's really cool about you, Swig, is that, you know, a lot of people go about this location freedom, digital nomad thing by starting an online business or getting a remote job. Right. What you do differently, and you actually wrote a whole book about this, which became a bestseller. I had a smaller acquisition before this, this kind of bigger one. That was sort of a testing ground for me where I was like, implement a lot of quick fixes in this, get my return on investment in under eight months. And so I was like, okay, I can do this for a smaller business. Let's put the funds together. Let's do it for something bigger. If it already has that solid foundation, there's gonna be exponential growth. How are you able to negotiate? How do they walk through? How did you walk through that process to get the business for what you thought it was worth without kind of breaking the whole deal up? Yeah, so typically what I'm doing is Welcome back to the Niche Pursuits podcast. My name is Jared Bauman, and today we're joined by uh, Mike Swiskonski. Mike, welcome. I got your name right, I think. I was nervous about saying it. I practiced it a couple of times. Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> yeah, Jared, thanks so much. It's a tough name. Don't worry. It's uh, I'm used to it my whole life. People, a, a ton of different variations of it, but overall, it's, uh, it's no worries. But I'm looking forward to uh, chatting with you about uh, online business space. Yeah, it's going to be good to have you. You know, we're talking um, about a couple different subjects as they roll into your story here. Acquisitions, software as a service. I mean, uh, what could be better than talking SaaS on, on, a, uh, on a Wednesday morning here? But I maybe before we dive in, as we like to do on the podcast, give us a little backstory, a little history about yourself. Bring us up to speed with where the story starts today. Yeah, so I guess the Cliff Notes version is I got started with kind of working and living abroad very early with study abroad. Fast forward to my senior year, I decided to take a study abroad group over to Europe. I was working for the University of Missouri. And essentially my first job out of university was working for a university in Prague, teaching financial economics. Now, why is this relevant to the online business space? Because it started this movement, this light bulb moment for me where hey, I was able to show up overseas in a new country, find a prestigious job, and essentially be able to work and travel, right? And then that slowly transitioned from working at physical locations overseas to working remotely overseas, right? Working for tech startups, working in sales and marketing. And uh, I was eventually, you know, fast forward, let's say five or six years later, I was... Uh, hired on early at Empire Flippers. I was employee number four there. So that was a very pivotal moment for me because one, I was able to put my marketing and sales skills to test with a hyper growth kind of foundation to build off of, but also on the flip side, seeing behind the internet. How is everything monetized and what's real and what isn't real? So I helped scale the the company over there from around five employees to hundreds of employees all around the world, brokered you know, more than $120 million worth of deals, and eventually put my, my kind of belief in the industry to like, hey, let's, I, I, I believe in this industry of buying businesses. I believe in entrepreneurship. Let's put it to the test. And so I had my first acquisition uh, for a software business, and that kind of sparked this whole ordeal of, again, buying my own portfolio, and then also helping others on both ends, buying and selling, right? Empire Flippers is a name I think a lot of people will be familiar with who listen to this podcast. What was You talked just a bit, maybe I could just ask one question about that. You talked a bit about like understanding what's real and what isn't real in terms of making money online. Like, Could you unpack that maybe a little bit more? I, I would be so fascinated to hear some of the high level, in, I know you can't share for NDA and all different things like that about the specifics, but just from a high level, like what does it look like when, what were the big, I guess a big coming to knows from a high level about where people really make money online and maybe where people don't make money online. Yeah, I would say the first like the level one barrier for me was just, hey, this stuff actually works. There's a lot of people doing it. And again, it's a bit of the survivorship bias where you're seeing the most profitable, you know, mature businesses. But one, just believing that you can make a lot of money online. And there's a lot of people who are probably less educated less qualified doing that. They've just done it for longer. They've taken higher risk and they found uh, the right opportunity. But, you know, the second thing is 
a lot of boring kind of day-to-day businesses just make a lot of money. Like, you know, if you want to just be the the toilet king, person selling toilets online, there's like niches like that, that aren't very exciting, probably aren't going to be the highlight of the event at a dinner party, but they can make some really good money and they can actually be sold for a, a great deal uh, of money you know, of money later, right? They're very sellable businesses because there's not a face attached to it, an identity attached to it. And so while I love personal brands and I, I think that's, it's always powerful and always helps you leverage. There are a lot of niche businesses that are making, you know, millions of dollars a month and nobody would, would have any idea. Well, let's talk about the business that you bought. I mean, is that a good place to launch us off? I, I think, I mean, we could probably talk way more about Empire Flip is your time there, the deals you saw. But I mean, I will say from the outset that I'm, I've am i always had this underlying desire to buy a SaaS product. So I was secretly very excited for this interview to begin with. But maybe let's, let's, let's dive into the acquisition process and any relevant details that you were looking for as it relates to what you bought. Yeah, so I would say like I had a smaller acquisition before this this kind of bigger one, um, and that was sort of a testing ground for me, where I was like I was able to implement a lot of quick fixes in this, get my return on investment in under eight months, and so I was like, okay, I can do this for a smaller business. Let's put the funds together. Let's do it for something bigger, because if if it already has that solid foundation, there's going to be exponential growth. So. Uh, this deal uh, was listed for around half a million dollars, I think 515, if I remember correctly. And I have an acquisition program where I help first time buyers. And it was actually uh, a deal that myself and my student were looking at. My student had certain investors and pretty strict criteria. They didn't want to deal with something that was outside of the United States. They didn't want something that was fully custom built. So they had passed on this deal initially, but I'd spent let's just say six weeks talking to the seller, doing due diligence on it. And while it wasn't a good fit for them, it was a pretty good fit for my skill sets because I saw a lot of the reasons that this people were passing on this deal as opportunities. And those opportunities were something where within one or two months, we could really grow and scale this business. And to give you a few examples of what that means is the things I loved about the business were it was a one- owner business, one developer who had no real lens for marketing. They found the right niche. They got a little bit of tra- like traction and it just snowballed over time, but they were more developer focused, building new features, building, uh, you know, improving things and actually over developing it where after we acquired it, we asked them to turn off five or six different features because they just weren't being used. <laughs> so that was kind of the foundation of why we love this deal. And a few of the things that we we really saw for growth opportunities was it's a 10-year-old business, ranking very well, has a huge moat around it because to build this business from scratch, the software business, and that's the reason I love the software space, it has a bigger moat than almost any other business model. 